We recognize that the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society gathers on the traditional land of the Western Abenaki people. We respect the Abenaki's spiritual and life-giving relationship to this land. We seek to honor the living traditions of the Abenaki people, and we humbly hope to learn from them how we may better live in harmony with the land and our fellow humans. Good morning everyone and welcome to the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society's October 18th service. My name is Ren Caldwell and I will be serving as worship associate today for the Reverend Barnaby Feeder who is leading today's service. If you are visiting us for the first time, please send us a message to introduce yourself and be sure to join us after the service for our virtual coffee hour for good conversation and company. If you haven't already done so, this would be the perfect time to, to turn off your cell phones or and any other electronic devices, except the one you're streaming this service on. If anybody has milestones and passages to share today that they haven't yet sent to Barnaby, they can type them into the Zoom chat to be read during the service. Our call to worship is from Voices from the Margins, an anthology of medications, published in 2012. The Reverend Joseph Cherry, a gay man of Mexican and Polish descent raised in Detroit, is currently the minister at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland, Ohio. Prayer for living intention. If we, if we have any hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort, brave enough to be clumsy there, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others. May we, as a people of faith, be granted the strength to be so bold, so brave, and so loving. We do a lot together outside of Sunday worship, all the while observing COVID-19 safety guidelines. Be sure to look at your recently published October newsletter for these pathways to connection to CVUUS programs and your fellow UUs. Meanwhile, let me point out the following. 
Chartered House could use help any day with passing out lunches as takeout, 11 a.m. to 12.15 p.m., or helping pack out dinners to be delivered to residents in hotels, 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Call Doug at 989-8621 to arrange your first day. Alan Moore coordinates Charter House meal prep for CVU US and did prep again yesterday in Lower Level Kitchen along with Sheila House, Michelle Lowey, and Gail Munchow, making chili and cornbread supper for Charter House's 85 guests. CVU US commits to this once a month for a Tuesday night meal. Middlebury College students will begin using our kitchen on Saturdays to make meals for Charter House until the college closes its campus in November. Charter House has filled our freezer with provisions for future meals. We appreciate donations to offset the cost of these towards CVUS Social Action Fund. The Winter Clothes Giveaway at Middlebury United Methodist Church is coming soon, and this year donations are needed more than ever. Beginning Monday, October 19th through Monday, October 26th, donations of winter clothes will be welcome at U Middlebury United Methodist Church. Good clean coats, mittens, sweaters, winter pants, and boots will be given away on November 6th, 7th, 13th and 14th. To schedule a time to drop off donations or for more information, please call Margaret Cloak at 989-7363. There is a special pathway to connection available in November and April every year. That's when Reverend Barnaby and lay leaders conduct a short series of classes for new visitors and longtime friends interested in knowing more about becoming official voting members of our congregation. These new UU classes bring, begin with a time to share our personal spiritual journeys that brought us to CVU US. We also look at the diverse beliefs about religion one encounters at most UU congregations. The second class covers UU history with a focus on some of the notable men and women whose lives shaped Unitarianism and Universalism. Reverend Barnaby likes to call it a whirlwind tour of 2000 years of heresy. The third class covers the history of CVU US and how we govern ourselves. Reverend Barnaby will be conducting these 90 minute classes online. He needs to know as soon as possible if you might want to come to one or all of them in order to set up the most convenient schedule for everyone involved. Current members are also welcome to join in, both as a refresher course or to meet newcomers. Feel free to leave a note to him in the chat box today or to call or email him. Now I invite everyone to join me in reading the chalice lighting as it appears on your screen. On the, on the Brink by Reverend Leslie Takahashi Morris. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create. A deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a deeper joy in this life we share. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to seek what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. And may Uh, before I start, I accidentally kicked myself out of the meeting. 
Um, so I'm wondering if Richard could make me a co-host again so I can share my screen and record. These are the joys of live, <laughs> of doing it live, folks. This may take a moment to get this going. Anyone know any good jokes while we're waiting? Oh, there we go. Thank you, Richard, Invisible Richard, who does so many things to be helpful. All right, my friends. So good morning. Um, I'm here to model being human and making mistakes for everybody. Um, this morning, we're, we're looking at some ideas about forgiveness, right? There's a lot of working on that this month as there is a lot of working on that uh, every month in our lives, really. But at, at CVU US, forgiveness is one of the things we're really thinking about and talking about and looking at this month in services. And an area where we especially need to work on this, at least for me as a white person, is the area of racism. So there's a book I'm gonna share with you this morning. And this book is kind of a funny thing. Um, I'm just gonna, let's see, get this going. So here's what's a little funny about this book. This book is a board book, right? It's like a board book that looks like it's made for reading to babies or toddlers. And visually, I think it is, um, but I think, I don't know what was in the mind of Ibram X. Kendi who made the book when he, cause I haven't like read, read interviews about it. So I don't know who he was aiming for exactly age wise, but in my mind, it feels like a book for adults that you take in kind of as you read it to kids and um, think about how we're raising kids and especially how we're doing things ourselves as adults. So I'm going to say a little bit more about Ibram X. Kendi after I, after I read it. Let me just make myself small here. All right. So Anti-Racist Baby by Ibram X. Kendi. And Ash Ashley Lukashevsky did the illustrations, which are pretty great. Anti-racist baby is bred, not born. Anti-racist baby is raised to make society transform. Babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There's no neutrality. Take these nine steps to make equity a reality. And then on the screen, it says race for non-readers. Number one, open your eyes to all skin colors. Anti-racist baby learns all the colors, not because race is true. If you claim to be colorblind, you deny what's right in front of you. Two, use your words to talk about race. No one will see racism if we only stay silent. If we don't name racism, it won't stop being so violent. Three, point at policies as the problem not people. Some people get more while others get less because policies don't always grant equal access. Policies are kind of like rules. Four, shout, there's nothing wrong with the people. Even though all races are not treated the same, we are all human, anti-racist baby can proclaim. Five, celebrate all our differences. Anti-racist baby doesn't see certain groups as better or worse. Anti-racist baby loves a world that's truly diverse. Six, knock down the stack of cultural blocks. Anti-racist baby appreciates how groups speak, dance, and create as they choose. Anti-racist baby welcomes all groups voicing their unique views. Seven, confess when being racist. 
Nothing disrupts racism more than when we confess the racist ideas that we sometimes express. Eight, grow to be an anti-racist. Anti-racist baby is always learning, changing, and growing. Anti-racist baby stays curious about all people and isn't all-knowing. Nine, believe we shall overcome racism. Anti-racist baby is filled with the power to transcend, my friend, and doesn't judge a book by its cover, but reads until the end. So the interesting thing I just wanted to share for those of you that have never heard of Ibram X. Kendi is he's written a bunch of books um, that are fantastic books that I strongly recommend reading. There's a book called Stamped from the Beginning. It's, a, it's called A History of Racism in the United States. There's a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he just came out a week ago with a journal that's something for people to use at home directly for each of us that's called Be Anti-Racist, a journal for awareness, reflection, and action. And at this point, CVU US doesn't have any of these books yet, but Artley is hoping to get them at some point. We have a limited library budget, so she has to really pick and choose with what she gets. Ilsley Library does have them as well as a lot of other libraries. So I read this book because I really just wanna lift up again that the idea of being an anti-racist is one that takes us thinking about it again and again and again, right? You don't just think, here's what I'm gonna do, and then you do it and you're done, perfection, move on to the next thing. It's gonna take us our entire lives to be working on this, right? For me, I have to renew my commitment to being an anti-racist all the time. And one of the great things is I'm raising kids, so I have a chance to try to raise anti-racist kids um, who will be better than I was as a kid at being aware of what's going on and really trying to take action especially as white kids, but all of us need to think about how we look at other groups and other people. So my wish for you, everybody, kids and grownups and all of those in between, is that as you move through the week, you notice how you are thinking about other people. I kind of said that last week, but really notice um, how it feels to be in the world around other people, especially right now, and really try to focus on the idea that we're part of one group of people, even as we are different and look different and think different and believe different things, really trying to focus in as we see people in the grocery store or the parking lot or on Zoom, trying to see how we're all jointly connected and for kids really noticing that too especially at this time where we are very spread out and it is hard sometimes to make connections. So I just wanna end by saying, I met with coming of age kids yesterday outside on the lawn in front of CVU US and it was so amazingly great. <laughs> it was me and 12 kids and Tracy Harrington and it brought me so much joy to be with the kids in person. And I really look forward to seeing many more people and kids um, face-to-face -face in all the creative different ways we can find to do it. So I love you. I miss all of you. Have a great week. Thank you, Poppy, for that wonderful period of sharing with us. And it's such great news that you were able to meet with the coming of age kids. I can't wait to talk to you more about that. Um, this is the part of our service where we talk about sharing um, our gifts with others in the community who are doing work that represents our values. And this month we are sharing our offering with the Vermont Food Bank. It's particularly an important time for us to be doing that because the Food Bank does a lot of work of moving food from where it's uh, available to people who really, really need it. And as the harvest season comes to an end, there's lots of creative challenges for them to do that. So I invite you to uh, watch the little uh, 
video we're showing that gives you some more information about the food bank and how to share in this offering. And I invite you to be as generous as you are able this morning. Well, welcome to the milestones and passages part of our worship together this morning. I want to particularly thank those of you who got your milestones into me earlier in the week. Uh, and I think I've picked up the ones on chat. I apologize in advance if I missed something. I want to start with mentioning that I heard from Dee Carroll that uh, the funeral for her husband Bob will be today at 2 p.m. Uh, in Westport, just across the lake, celebration of life at, at Ballard Park. It's going to be a small gathering uh, with friends and family there. Um, but Dee says they will be live streaming it too as an alternative to being there. So uh, if you really want to see that live stream of the funeral service, I think you can uh, check our directory and get in touch with Dee and she'll give you the information. Uh, this from Carl Lindholm. 30 years ago today, October 18th, after her office hours, Brett Millier walked across the Middlebury College campus to the Dean of Students office, and she and Carl Lindholm walked to the house of Chaplain John Walsh, where they exchanged vows and were married. Then the wedding party, all five of them, went to dinner at Mr. Upps. Later in the year, in November, they did have a big celebration with Big Joe Burrell and the unknown blues band providing the music. Carl, thanks for this. We're so glad to relive that moment of joy for you and Brett. And uh, we get the joy many years on of this long and fruitful marriage. So thank you. Um, Ellen Flight uh, shared with me that she's in the fourth day of recovery today from breaking a radial bone in her arm. Um, and uh, Michelle and I were able to, to take her a little device that helps her take showers and things without getting the cast wet. Uh, I know that there are several other people who've had um, minor procedures this week that really help make life better. Um, I don't have permission to share their names, but it feels to me like there's been a week of, of getting medical things done that make us healthier and better. And so I'm, I'm feeling good about that. And I know the congregation is extending private wishes of support and gladness to all those who are on that journey. Uh, Julie and Neil Chippendale are celebrating their grandson Rohan's fourth birthday today. Yes, even in the times of COVID, people keep getting older. They're, they're looking forward to FaceTime today with their grandchild. And I'm sure that um, despite not being able to be there in person, Rohan's gonna know once again how much Julie and Neil love him. And we send along our best wishes to amplify that. 
Now, normally at this time in our service, I send you off into a period of silent prayer meditation for you to, to look at what's on your hearts um, as we move along into the latter part of the service. Um, and I do invite you to do that today. But if you're not sure where you are and you want something to think about, let me just say that we're going to be coming out of this period of silence with a choir's rendition of the tune De Colores. Now this is a Spanish song that the origins are lost in time. It's hundreds of years old, but it came to the new world and was adopted um, by various labor and social justice movements over 50 or 60 years ago. And um, uh, Lucy did some wonderful research and sent me um, some memories people had of singing De Colores at the farm workers organization events during the, the strikes organized by Cesar Savez to create social justice uh, in how farm workers are treated. And um, one from a woman named Kathy Morgia talked about every meeting ending with joining hands and singing De Colores, which enhanced the sense of community and being connected in the struggle for justice and how they sang that for, for decades after they started doing that in the 1960s. And then she says, even today, recalling the smiles and brightness of the faces of the workers as they sang provides a sense of hope. We were part of a movement and in small incremental ways, we believe we were changing the course of history and ending exploitation. And that's something to keep in mind as we talk about our sermon talk at, topic of forgiveness and group activities. I wanna add one more voice from that farm workers movement. And that's a woman named Abby Rivera who said she learned it as a child and they sang it all the time at everything, funerals, special events, memorial services and union organizing meetings. She got sick of it but she said, we always stood with arms crossed in front, reaching right to left to hold hands with someone else at the union meetings. And she discovered something unusual about that. Her first thought would be, here we go again. And she would complain to herself and sometimes even make faces. And then in the singing, after the first few lines, her entire demeanor and attitude would change. And by the time the song was over, a total transformation of her spirit would have occurred, making her glad she had sung it. And this is something uh, we are straining to hang on to in this time of COVID when we can't be together. So remember this spirit and be thinking about how you metaphorically can reach your arms across to the people you're going through life with and making the world better at the end of this time of silence when the choir sings De Colores.
Thank you so much to our choir and to Eric for working behind the scenes to bring them all together to us virtually. There's a lot more reaching out that goes on when we do our services this way than sometimes when we're together and we can actually touch each other. Um, in honor of baseball's upcoming World Series, in the face of the pandemic, I'm going to try to usher us around three bases and back to home this morning. And by home, I mean in this case, our congregation as a vibrant outlet for the shared values of nurturing, justice, compassion, and beauty. I wanna start by revisiting a scene I shared quite a few years ago about hundreds of high school students hoping to get a kiss at the school dance, first base in that old sexual courtship sense. My high school at the northern edge of San Francisco Bay area in the region today known as Silicon Valley was, was one of the first in the country to experiment with computer matchmaking. We signed up with a service run by college students at Harvard or MIT, I can't remember which, in 1967. Uh, those colleges were among the first early experimenters with computer dating apps. So the first step for us at the high school was everyone filling out a questionnaire about our likes and dislikes several weeks before the dance. Uh, in retrospect, I realize it presumed that we were all straight. Uh, no one objected, of course, because there were no out gay students at our suburban school, even though San Francisco itself was already home to a thriving gay community. Well, leaving that aside, when we arrived at the dance, we were given a number to pin on and a printout of the numbers of those who the computer had identified as good matches based on the questionnaires. So it turned out there were two strategies for filling out the form. Uh, you might call them open-minded or targeted. Some of us expressed no or minimal concern about nearly everything on the questionnaire. The year in school, physical characteristics, what sports people like, favorite movie genres, none of it seemed to matter to the kids who filled out their questionnaires this way, or so they said. They ended up with virtually every one of the opposite sex listed as an ideal date on the printout of numbers that they got when they arrived at the dance. Now, the people who had a more targeted response, one that actually expressed preferences, ended up with at best maybe two or three matches that they had to find from the numbers pinned on people throughout the dance. Well, within 15 minutes of the beginning of the dance, almost everyone had taken off their numbers and returned to the old fashioned ways of finding people to dance or talk with. Once we saw what numbers the computers had matched us up with, we decided that computers were even stupider than the average person over 30. So this whole experience came to mind this week when I heard that only 27 of you had responded to our congregational questionnaire. Unlike the college students who sold my high school of service, your fellow congregants who prepared the questionnaire will be the first to admit that it's not professional grade. The questions weren't pre-tested in ways that could support a guarantee of helpful results to every question. But let's be clear about this. The goal isn't to provide an ideal match between each of us and the CVUUS of the future. It is simply to connect with everyone. It can help us think more creatively about the different ways this diverse congregation can serve the interests and needs of all of us. So I urge you to open up this questionnaire from our website or your Wednesday email blast. I urge you to take a few minutes to fill out what makes sense to you. If you have an enlightening quibble with some of the offered answers in the questionnaire, do the you, you thing, tell us in a kind way. Give us that metaphorical kiss of your attention to this. In this time when social distancing is required, we will be thrilled. Now let's head for second base. It's where we find another you, you congregation that really got its act together. True, it took 80 years, but that's part of the story of how congregations work. The first character we need to meet 
is an amazing African-American pastor and racial justice advocate named William Henry Gray Carter, who was born in 1877. W.H.G. Carter, as he preferred to be known, was an Arkansas native. There's an amazing family history. Um, he's related on one side to a prominent Confederate politician, indeed the man who signed John Brown's death warrant as governor of Virginia, and on the other side to uh, an amazing number of black people who succeeded after one progenitor was freed from slavery. He earned a divinity school credential as an African Methodist Episcopal minister, and then he declined to accept it. Why? He had decided through independent study while he was in seminary that he was a Unitarian. After a stint in the army, he married Beulah Griffin in 1899 and moved what would eventually become a family of 14 children to Memphis and then in 1918 to Cincinnati, Ohio. Soon after that last move, he founded a church where he could preach his Unitarian religion. He proclaimed a loving God, faith in reason, and worship of the kinds of deeds Jesus and other great human leaders had done for people in need, not creeds that all church members had to accept. Although Reverend Carter stood an imposing six feet two inches and was an outspoken figure in the community, he was pointedly ignored by Cincinnati's white Unitarian and Universalist churches. The American Unitarian Association of Boston did not even hear of his existence until 1938, 20 years after his church was founded. At that point, the Reverend Lon Call was sent out from Boston to assess how the denomination should respond to Carter's Unitarian ministry. Reverend Call attended services. He praised Carter's kindness and intelligence, and he even preached to that congregation one Sunday. He described what he found as, quote, a vacant store in which Mr. Carter had assembled a small coal stove, hat rack, bookcase, other shelves of books, radio, piano, clock, two printing presses, architect's desk, bulletin board, about 30 chairs, some old pews, and a crude drawing of Jesus. Mr. Carter rents this himself and lives in the rear. He pays $18 a month in rent. Outside the store in vivid paint is a sign Unitarian Brotherhood Church. Reverend Call felt the congregation, which never had more than 60 members, would not survive. He recommended against investing in it or granting ministerial fellowship to Reverend Carter. Within two years, the church closed. Reverend Carter continued to live out his UU values. He was an anti-poverty and racist justice activist right up until his death in 1962. There is so much more to say about this man and his equally extraordinary five foot tall wife who was known for warmth and compassion that matched his stern righteousness. She didn't agree with his religion but played piano for his services and cooked for hundreds. As one grandson recalled, if she saw you, she hugged you. If she hugged you, she kissed you. And she always knew your name. I bring Reverend Carter before you today because long after he had been forgotten by the other Unitarian churches in Cincinnati, Reverend Mark Morrison Reed, a budding UU minister who was black, published research on black Unitarian pioneers that mentioned him. That eventually brought Reverend Carter to the attention of Reverend Sharon Dittmer, an interim minister at a church founded outside Cincinnati by Unitarians who had moved to the suburbs. She told her congregants what she knew about Reverend Carter's story on a Sunday where, to their mutual astonishment, one of Carter's grandchildren happened to be attending. That inspired her when she moved downtown to become the first minister, the minister at First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati to challenge that congregation to look at its role and what had happened to Carter and his family. Shamed by their ignorance of the story, the congregants began to research its details. They reached out to family survivors as part of this. And two years later, 
at a dramatic Sunday service in 2001. The congregation shared the history it had uncovered, including many details unknown to the family. It apologized to more than 100 Carter descendants present for the event. A great granddaughter, Dr. Starita Smith, rose to speak. She said more than an apology was needed. She asked what the church planned to do next. True racial reconciliation requires an ongoing commitment outside the confines of the church, she said. And then, to the shock and joy of many, she added, we accept your apology. In the ensuing years, the congregation has attempted in many ways to keep that commitment alive. It has raised more than $70,000 to aid the kind of marginalized neighbors Reverend Carter spent his whole life serving. According to Reverend Connie Simon, the black woman who is now First Unitarian's lead minister. In addition, the previously unmarked graves of Reverend Carter and his wife were located and honored. Ironically enough, in a cemetery right next to that suburban church where Reverend Dittmer first preached about his existence to the congregation. The reconciliation service that the First Unitarian Church holds annually is celebrated in a variety of ways. From this position on second base, we can see what it might look like when an entire congregation, as well as individuals, pursue forgiveness, which puts third base in our sight. During our Rosh Hashanah service last month, our choir sang a litany of atonement written by Reverend Robert Eller Isaacs, a Jewish UU. I told you at the time the backstory of my relationship with Rob and how he had written the litany in the singular. I forgive myself and you and we begin again in love. But without telling him, our denomination had made the words plural in our hymnal. So our choir sang of collective forgiveness. We forgive ourselves and each other. We, be, we begin again in love. And I forgive you if you don't recall this. I said to you that although I believe like Rob that individual acts of forgiveness are the core of the spiritual practice of forgiveness, collective forgiveness is important too. I said I'd come back to that subject. Well, here we are. The story of Reverend Carter in First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati makes a point about collective forgiveness. But it struck me that we can't get where we want. We can't get home by surveying the historical landscape for examples of congregations forgiving and being forgiven. The past can't teach us how to be a congregation these days. The coronavirus keeps us too far apart, too many ways, too much of the time. Now filling in our questionnaire may help, but I fear it will just scratch the surface of how disassembled we are by our circumstances today. This isn't because you are rejecting the vision in our purpose statement. It's because so many of us feel we lack the time, safety, and energy to invent and commit to new ways of being in touch. This need to reinvent ourselves to reach third base is too daunting a topic for me to go into right here. So I'm going to move straight to what I imagine it will feel like if we get to third and can focus on heading home. And I want to start with Ren, our worship associate, reading you a poem by Sherman Alexi, a Native American whose tribal roots are in the eastern part of the state of Washington and northern Idaho. This week, as is always the case when one of us who is white is reading the words of an African-American, indigenous writer, or other person of color, Ren is reading as a listener, not a speaker. The powwow at the end of the world. I am told by many of you that I must forgive. And so I shall after an Indian woman puts her shoulder to the Grand Coulee Dam and topples it. I am told by many of you that I must forgive. And so I shall after the floodwaters burst each successive dam downriver from the Grand Coulee. I am told by many of you that I must forgive. And so I shall after the floodwaters find their way 
to the mouth of the Columbia River as it enters the Pacific and causes all of it to rise. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall after the first drop of flood water is swallowed by that salmon waiting in the Pacific. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall after that salmon swims upstream through the mouth of the Columbia and then past the flooded cities, broken dams, and, ab and abandoned reactors of Hanford. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall after that salmon swims through the mouth of the Spokane River as it meets the Columbia, then upstream, until it arrives in the sh shallows of a secret bay on the reservation where I wait alone. I am told by many of the you that I must forgive, and so I shall after that salmon leaps into the night air above the water, throws a lightning bolt at the brush near my feet, and, sets the, and starts the fire, which will lead all of the lost Indians home. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall after we Indians have gathered around the fire with that salmon who has three stories and must tell before sunrise. One story will teach us how to pray, another story will make us laugh for hours, the third story will give us a reason to dance. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall when I am dancing with my tribe during the powwow at the end of the world. So you heard one I statement after another in that poem, but don't be fooled. The you Alexei is addressing is collective. He names those advising him to forgive as an undifferentiated many of you. It's all of the white folk who stole from, exploited and oppressed Native Americans for so long in so many ways. It truly feels to him that the communal celebration, the powwow he seeks could only happen at the end of the modern world as Native Americans have experienced it. The many of you we can assume also includes Native Americans who have bought in to the new order created by their ancestors conquerors and even kind-hearted descendants of the conquerors who may wish him well, but are not surrendering their inherited privileges. Alexei says forgiveness can only happen through an extraordinary reconnection with the natural world. We have done so much to destroy. Speaking from his perspective, from his roots in the Pacific Northwest, Alexei chose the salmon as linchpin of this recreation of right relationships. He laid out one unlikely hurdle after another as a prerequisite, arrival at a secret bay upstream from the dams that had been destroyed so that the Columbia River can run free, a salmon thrown lightning bolt to create a fire at his feet. The fire itself summons to the tribes, all of the tribes to a powwow. And finally, what is needed is for all to receive three wisdom stories from the salmon during the dark night. One about how to pray, one that will make the indigenous people who have suffered for so long laugh for hours, and one that will give them reason to dance. There is so much truth telling here, but it wasn't an easy choice to share this poem today. I have been concerned about the recent revelations that Alexei eventually misused the power he was beginning to accumulate in literary circles when he published this poem in 1996. In later years, he repeatedly sexually abused young Native American women writers coming to him for guidance and support. To be sure, he quickly acknowledged the truth in the claims as they became public in 2018, unlike so many who have been called to account by the Me Too movement. He also at that time declined to accept a major award that had been given him, cutting short any question about whether it should be withdrawn. And it's true the complaints didn't charge him with offenses on the scale for which men like Harvey Weinstein, Roger Ailes, Jeremy Epstein, and even President Trump have become known. But this is not to say I take lightly the possibility that some of you would prefer that no known abuser ever be lifted up as a source of wisdom from our pulpit, even when the pulpit is me sitting at home. I use this reading with many purposes. One is that I want us to be clear that the home a congregation reaches when we navigate the bases safely is not heaven. It's a complex space 
in this world where every new play begins for better or worse. And sometimes the people who groups, the, excuse me, the people or the groups who are teaching us crucial lessons, like how hard we are to forgive, are also in need of forgiveness, although not from us. The great joy for us in this angry, sorrow-filled poem from a man who needs forgiveness is that it brings us round to what we must affirm as a UU congregation, that our calling in the face of failures and transgressions is always, always to embody our longing to begin again in love. May we embrace Alexi's indigenous perspective that guides us in three ways as we pursue our calling. May we learn more about how to pray on our own together, even though we are kept apart by this virus. May we help each other laugh long and hard, even though we are kept apart by this virus. May we celebrate life so intensely that we dance in body or spirit, even though we are kept apart by this virus. I believe that's not a bad description of what it feels like for a congregation to reach home plate in these times. Blessed be and amen. benediction today, I want to mention that in our coffee hour time, we are going to actually have a chance to think specifically about being a congregation in COVID times, because we're going to have a congregational conversation about how we want to celebrate December and all of the holidays that come in December. And uh, as with every congregational conversation, this is not a meeting to make decisions. This is a meeting for us to just share our thoughts and react to what we're hearing. So I invite you to attend that in coffee hour if you'd like. If you want to just meet with a, a smaller group of people in a separate room for coffee hour the way we normally do, you're of course welcome to do that as well. And uh, Lucy will take care of making sure you end up in the right place. I invite you as you go forth this week tail end of October, rounding the bend into November, a time of high anxiety for all of us for many, many reasons, that you remember there is so much strength in what we have built together and in the foundation it has created for developing and inventing ways for us to get through this time, not just surviving it, but growing, prospering, and coming out on the other side even more aligned with our values and of more meaningful ways of being in the world than we would ever have had had we not had this challenge thrown in our path. Blessed be and amen.